I'm assuming you can see the screen. And if you can't, let me know. It's the lesson 47 on biblical hermeneutics. And we'll go and continue until we finish the material. We're going to look at types and antitypes. These are very important. I believe a type and an antitype arrangement is a kind of prophecy. Prophecy. So these are, in my judgment, they're prophecies in a, in a sense. Type and a type arrangement serves several purposes in the Word of God. Uh, it, it is prophetic, it is instructional, and it's very efficient in teaching. So it teaches, it instructs, and it's prophetic. And so it's very efficient in its teaching as well. The word type is according to Merriam-Webster is the from Greek tupos or typos. They blow or impression a mark, an emblem, an allegorical or symbolic representation of some object, which is called the antitype. A symbol which prefigures something else. This is pretty good. Pretty good definition from English dictionaries. Antitype, that which is correlated to, to the type, that which is prefigured or represented by the type itself. So again, this is our English words, type and antitype. And uh, antitype comes from the Greek word, antitypos. We'll look at that in just a minute. The word, the type is a tupos, is the Greek word, tupos or typos. Uh, in, other, in fact, our English word type came from this language, this word. The, the mark of a stroke, a blow or a print, a figure formed by a blow or an impression, an example to be imitated in the doctrinal sense, a type uh, that is a person or thing prefiguring the future messianic person or thing. So again, something in the past that prefigures something in the future, it was designed to prefigure it. That's, that's the key to it, designed to do that. That's Tupos or typos uh, is uh, translated print, figure, and of course figures, sometimes plural, fashion, manner, form, example, and examples, and examples. So they're spelled two different ways and pattern in the King James Version. All of these words are from that same word. So we have them here. Uh, it's, it's translated all these different ways in the King James Road. The word antitypos, antitype, is uh, actively repelling a blow or striking back, echoing or reflecting light, resisting or rough. In the New Testament language, antitypon, as a substantive means, a substantive is something that acts like an animal is a thing formed after some pattern, two posts. Right? And a thing resembling another is counterpart, something in the Messianic times, which answers to the type prefiguring it in the Old Testament. So I'll have a, a one here. This should be a tall instead of a question mark. Okay, I'll correct it later. Okay. Two typos, two posts, is found in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, and 11. And that's going to relate to our lesson. This word's found 14 other times in the Greek New Testament. Anti antitypes, antitypos, is found in Hebrews 9, 24, and 1 Peter 3, 21. I'm going to relate this to our lesson as well. These are the only places where the Greek word antitypos is found. So it's on the place it's found. It's two passages. Let's look at the characters of a type. It must represent a future truth, never a present truth. So it doesn't represent something presently existing. It represented something in the future. The type did. A type and antitype were never the same thing. The antitype is always superior to the type, always. The type usually has one purpose, 
which can be found by noting or observing and determining the similarity between the type and the anotype. That's the purpose. Must have been intended to represent the thought or truth when it was given. That's another point. It was in God's design that represented or prophesy of something in the future. Now, we find sometimes something may be an allegory, which would be something that wasn't necessarily designed to represent that. The type must have been a real person, a real event, or a real thing, or a real office. So it must have been real. The scriptures sometimes interpret the type and had a type for us. Sometimes the type assumes the name of the antitype or vice versa. And we'll see this is like Galatians 4.26. For the Jerusalem that is above is free, which is our mother. If we study the context, the Jerusalem that is above is free. It's, it's the New Covenant or the New Testament. And it's not the church. It's the New Testament. The New Testament. In Hebrews 12.22, but you're coming to Mount Zion. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the new host of angels. So here, the new covenant in verse 26 is called Jerusalem. In Hebrews 12 22, the church is called Mount Zion. Mount Zion represents the church, the heavenly Jerusalem. Again, this is a type, it had a type, it represents it. Okay. The type was designed by God to represent some person, office, or thing in the future as a form of prophecy. And the allegory was used to represent some person, office, or thing, just like the type, but it, the same so used was not designed to represent it by God. God didn't design it to represent this. So we need to keep that in mind. There's the there's the big difference between these two right there. Hagar and Ishmael were an allegory, Galatians 4:24. But God was not; uh, they were not designed by God to represent Christians and Jews, although they did in the allegory. We'll come back to the allegory of this later. So this is makes it different than the type. The type was designed to represent, but Hagar and Ishmael were never designed to represent it. Galatians 424, which things contain an allegory, see? So an allegory is a different uh, type. Well, these women are two covenants. So they're two covenants. One from Mount Sinai, that would be the law of Moses, the covenant with Moses and those under that covenant, the children of Israel. Bearing children under bondage, which is Hagar or Agar. Okay. Oh, some printings of the King James Version have it as Agar because there was no H in the Greek language. And in fact, there really wasn't an H in the Hebrew, in the English language until uh, after the King James 1611 edition was printed. God did not intend that Abraham have children while Sarah was living by another woman. Never intended that to happen. And Sarah tried to help God out and come up with a way for him to have him to fulfill his will. God didn't need her help. So they intervened and caused a mess, caused problems that we still have today. God used these things, however, after they occurred to teach us. He used them to teach us. And we see in Galatians 4.24 that he be, become an allegory by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Paul used it as an allegory. We'll come to allegories later and deal with them later. So there's a difference here. And the primary difference is that the allegory was not intended when it happened to represent but the type and antitype was intended. God planned it. God foreknew it and planned it ahead of time. Now, there's several examples of types and antitypes. We can have typical persons. A 
comparison is from a limited number of that person's characteristics. However, keep that in mind. Adam is a type of Christ. Moses uh, would be a type of Christ. He's a mediator Melchizedek as a high priest. David as a king. And David as a prophet as well. Melchizedek is priest and king. Moses as mediator and prophet and lawgiver. Adam as the beginning. We'll come to it later. Elijah. These, these men, uh, we can have a minute look at the characteristics of their lives and give some information. From them. Have examples or types, any types. Romans 5 12, therefore, as though through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death passed unto all men, for that all sin. So right here, this became a type, a type that by which uh, the uh, world had sin to enter, and then for until the law of sin was in the world, but as far as the law led you, sin was in the world until or with a view to the law. But sin is not imputed where there's no law. So the law laid out to what sin is. There's no law. If, it, if, it, there's, if there's no law, there's no sin. So, but if sin is not imputed, there's no law, he says. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even unto them that had had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. See right here, that's the word figure. That's the type. So the first man, Adam, had brought death. The second man, Adam, brought life. But not as the trespass, so also as the free gift. So the trespass of Moses in the same light, there's a free gift of a gift given by Jesus in his death. For if by the trespass of the one, the many died, but more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, found unto the many. So the, the blessing of Jesus came to take away and to bring good rather than to bring sin into the world. And not as through one that sin, so as gift for the judgment came unto one of the condemnation, but the free gift came of many trespasses under justification. So here we see the free gift, which is God's grace, this favor that brought remission of sins, uh, brought a plan of salvation. And this came through Jesus, the second. Adam. Jesus became the second Adam. For if by the trespass of the one death reigned through the one, much more shall they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of rise and reign in life through the one, even Jesus Christ. So death came through one, that is through Adam, and his sin and the favor, the gift of righteousness. Uh, Reign in, it will reign in life through the one even through Jesus. So what Jesus brought. So then as through one trespass, the judgment came unto all men to condemnation. That's through the trespass of Adam. Even so, through one act of righteousness, the free gift came unto all men to justification of life. So how is this an act of righteousness when Jesus is crucified? It's an act of righteousness because it took the blood of a an innocent person to bring about remission. And because of God's being just or fair or righteous, he had to purchase with that blood, he had to purchase all the people that are going to be saved. And if Jesus were just a mere man, and just a perfect man, but mere man, he would have only purchased one person. But since he's God in the flesh, he's deity, then we determine that he's 
infinitely more valuable than the than the human blood. His blood is so his his blood has the potential to bring about remission to an infinite number of humans. So there's no limit to his the blood reaching and being able to make atonement. So that's why it's an act of righteousness. And so we see a contrast between judgment and, and, and salvation, life. Judgment came to be into condemnation, so you do that one trespass. And then the free gift of what the Messiah brought, Jesus brought, will bring justification to all men. In Romans 5, 19, for through the one man's disobedience, that's Noah, many were made sinners. It doesn't say everybody was made sinners, it says many were. And they're made sinners if we study it through their through their sinning, through their being given over to sin. Even so, through the obedience of one shall the many be made righteous. The many is just as big a number here, and it's a it is, a, it is a concept that is, uh, doesn't lay out clearly how many this is. The word many just means a bunch. It doesn't have a number. So we need to be aware of this. Point is discussed in Romans 5, 12 through 19, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 15, 45. It's a form of antithesis in these verse, these passages. So we see it in antithesis. Yeah. Disobedience of one, the obedience of another. Just the opposite. Let's look at first Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So again we have death and life in contrast to each other. Death came to what Adam did, and that part third him be both physical death and spiritual death. But the spiritual death came because of sin and separated man from God. But the physical death didn't come at that time, it came later for Adam and Eve. So we see Adam in contrast bringing death, Christ bringing, making alive. In verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15, so also it is written, so now he quotes scripture. The first man Adam became a living soul, and the last man Adam, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So again, he became a living soul, and then the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. This type and the type arrangement is a form of antithesis. By antithesis, we mean it's antithesis. Anti is standing on the opposite side. In Greek, thesis is a statement of uh, principle. And so he's standing on the opposite side. And his arrangement is antithesis. So he stands over on the other side looking at the um, the thesis and then the antithesis is on the other side. That's how that's laid out. Adam, the type, was the beginning of sin. Christ, the end that was the end of sin. There's your antithesis. There's the two sides of the coin, we might say, the opposite side of the coin. The type was disobedient. Christ, the end type, was obedient. So Adam brought sin. Jesus brought an end of sin, a remission of sin. Adam was disobedient, Christ Jesus was obedient. Adam the type brought death, Christ the antitype brought life. Again, these are all parts of this type antitype arrangement. The type was natural, Christ the antitype was spiritual. Again, we see the contrast between the lesser and the greater. The spiritual is greater than natural. Let's back up a little bit. Death is greater than life. Uh, life is greater than death, I'm sorry. Obedience is greater than disobedience. Beginning of sin, the end of sin. The end of sin is greater than the beginning of sin. 
Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is superior to Adam in every way in this, in this contrast. Most of the comparisons between Adam and Jesus are antithesis, set against one another, opposite to each other. Remember the type and the type arrangement is prophetic in some in some of some future person, some future office of some people. And a type is always superior to the type in at least one aspect. Maybe more than one, but at least one. Type and a type arrangement is an excellent method of teaching and to making points made or the questions. Buddy. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. I, uh, you had mentioned uh, Galatians 4, excuse me, 426. And I hate to ask you back some slides there, but um, at some point you mentioned the New Testament, and I'm not sure the, the connection there. I missed it. 424. I thought it was 26. Maybe I'm wrong. But it was. Sorry. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, but the it's, Jerusalem that is above is free, which is our mother. Yes. And then you mentioned something about the New Testament at this point. You've got a little arrow there drawing the Jerusalem's the. the Jerusalem that's above is. And the. So let's, let's look in Galatians 4. We've got to pick up Galatians 4. Open your Bible to Galatians 4. That's a good question. So we'll, we'll deal with it. He's got a contrast here. And it starts in... Uh, hold on. Let's see. Galatians 4.21. Tell me you that be desired to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the handmaid and one, and one by the free woman. And so the handmaid will be Ishmael and the free woman will be Isaac, okay? And yeah. uh, be the son by the handmaid was born after the flesh. Uh, the mother, his mother was a young woman and uh, could have a baby easily. Sarah had gone beyond the age of childbearing, gone to what we probably call menopause, and uh, so she was uh, her having a baby who had to be performed by a miracle. Okay. God rejuvenated her, so that I believe, that so that she could have a baby, and of course the baby was born uh, of physical birth. But I think her ability to have the baby had to, had, came. Back. A miraculous intervention by God, right? Albeit the son by the handmaid is born after the flesh, okay? Verse 24, which things contain an allegory. So this is not a type and a type now. For these women are two covenants, see? So we got two covenants. One from Mount Sinai, bearing children under bondage, which is Hagar. So that's the, that's Mount Sinai, that's the law of Moses. Because Mount Sinai is where it was given. But the Jerusalem that is above, which is free, which is our mother. The Jerusalem above is the, the new covenant. See, these are two covenants. And so it is, this is the New Testament. Okay, so what's your question now? That uh, answered my question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Appreciate it. All right. Any, anybody else have questions? That's the two covenants there. We'll get to this later. This is an important passage. Covenants here. And they're laid out. All right, this is the end of this class for today. Uh, we don't have last week's up yet on, the, on the YouTube, but it'll be up, uh, no doubt, in the near future, okay? So, we're going to end the class right now. Stop recording.